Hi, I'm Taras Pluskin, and I'm here at the Top Shelf Aquatics retail facility right in front of our fish retail system. And I am standing next to a remarkable and wonderful example of Holocanthus silariaris, the queen angelfish, one of the most majestic and hallmark species of the Caribbean reef. Pomacanthidae, from the Greek cover thorn. This refers to the uniting feature of this family of these wonderful thorny projections that occur right below the operculum, the gill cover of all members of the Pomacanthidae, the marine angelfish. So welcome to this episode of TSA. And today we're gonna to be going through this wonderful fish family, discussing a little bit of its biology, overviewing a little bit of its diversity across the world's oceans, and then referring to some unifying things the reef aquarium industry at large has recognized when it comes to leading to success in general, when it comes to this wonderful and majestic family of reef fishes. There's extreme amount of diversity when it comes to the Pomacanthidae. As a whole, they are generally united by the somewhat pennate shape, while there is also an extreme and enormous amount of diversity when it comes to both their size. We can quickly compare the flame angelfish from the Cook Islands, maxing out at just a few inches with, let's say, the gray angelfish that can be found off the coast of here in Florida that can exceed a length of over 24 inches. There's also an extreme amount of diversity in the depths at which members of the Pomacanthidae can be found. Let's compare a lemon peel angelfish, which can occur in the Ryukyu Islands of Japan, but usually occurs and can be found within depths shallower than 60 feet. We can compare this to another Pomacanthid that lives right off the coast of the same islands, the Ryukus, the Japanese swallowtail masked angelfish, which can be commonly found at depths exceeding 500 feet. So we can see here that even though angelfish all have the same general body shape, there is an extreme amount of diversity when it comes to the species, where they can be found and how they find success in their natural habitat. Despite their diversity, there are some fascinating biological attributes which unite members of the Pomacanthidae. One seemingly unifying attribute is a color shift, which occurs from the juvenile fish after it achieves metamorphosis from the larval state to an adult. We can see here in a comparison between the juvenile emperor fish in our retail fish system has a significantly different uh, uh, coloration and patterning than its adult counterpart found here in our Sherwood production tank in the TSA farm. This dramatic color shift occurs in many, many pomacanthid species and should be always in the mind of the conscientious aquarist looking to purchase these small fish in a retail store such as ours, as the coloration you purchase may not be the coloration you're left with after years of having the fish, something which should be considered because many of these fish can exceed over 10 years of age in the wild. Something that also is of extreme contrast within members of the same species of pomacanthids, even adults, is sexual dimorphism, a $9 word that means males look significantly different than females of the same species. This can be wonderfully seen in these mass Japanese swallowtail angelfish we have here in the retail system, where as you can see, both are beautiful, but you can clearly see that the male does not have the same exact coloration or scale patterning as its female counterpart. Another unifying feature of the Pomacanthidae is that they are protogynous hermaphrodites. They all start off life as females. And as they get older and develop sexual maturity, these groups of individual pomacanthids operate in sexual harems, where one male, the oldest, will operate over two to three, depending on the species, females of the same species. They will then all spawn together in relative synchrony. Now, when the male of one of these sexual harems is either killed or is removed in some way, over a certain period of time, the largest subordinate female will undergo a sex change where they will transform into a male and assume the sexual and societal social role of the male inside that particular harem. Another fascinating attribute of the Pomacanthidae is the fact that they are true marine omnivores. 
They are in stark contrast to both abject carnivores that we've seen in other episodes on this channel, such as the groupers and the sea bass, the ceranids, and they're certainly in contrast to some of the more obligate herbivores, such as the rabbit fish, the ciganids, and certainly the acanthurids, the tanks. They dwell in the tricky middle ground for sure when it comes to them being true omnivores. This means that anything can and will be actively grazed on a marine angelfish species, depending on which species it is and what individual it is, how old that individual is, what its past experiences have been, and what the environmental settings are at the time. Because of this, it is one of the most fascinating things to try and understand the diet of any particular pomacanthid species, let alone individuals. And it's something that can be one of the most daunting challenges when it comes to housing these fish in captivity. For example, a single population of queen angelfish observed off the coast of San Paulo, Brazil, indicated that even though the fish was surrounded by potential forage in the forms of sponges, bryozoans, tunicates, and macroalgaes, it had a very selective diet for the most rare of these sponges and bryozoans, meaning that even though they are presented with ample opportunities to receive all the food they need, these fish, for whatever particular reasons that they may have, can and will be extremely selective even when abundant food is provided. Reef safe status of certain angelfish species is a subject of somewhat controversy in the reef aquarium hobby. Whereas some members of the reef aquarium hobby have had no issues with certain angelfish species and certain corals and certain clams, while others just can't have the same success reproduced when it comes to a different fish from the same species brought into their aquarium even when it may be the same corals and clams being munched on. So when it comes to evaluating the reef safe status of any member of the marine angelfish, it's very important to consider the risks associated with that particular species, with that particular uh, threat that it has, depending on what you have in your tank, and of course, the environmental conditions and the prey availability, how often you're feeding them, what the aggression rate is like in the tank that may induce the fish uh, to be more or less inclined to eat corals versus the actual foods that you're presenting it. Let's talk about some general recommendations when it comes to keeping members of the pomacanthidae alive in aquariums. Now, Certainly this changes in context when it comes to from smaller members of the pomacanthidae up to larger ones, but in general, they are a fish that requires a relatively larger aquarium. Certainly when you're dealing with members such as the gray angelfish and the French angelfish and the queen angelfish, we're talking 200 plus gallon aquariums. When we're talking about the smaller varieties such as the lemon peel, coral beauties and the like, think about 60 gallons plus. No matter how large of an aquarium is required, something which is also unifying is having large complex rock structures for these fish to be able to navigate, maneuver around, take rest in, and do everything that they need to do to feel comfortable as if they were on a wild reef. In addition to having rock structure and complex rock structure, it also helps to have a more seasoned and well-aged aquarium especially one that is more inclined to have lots of sessile life, such as sponges, tunicates, ample supply of corals, amphipods, polychaetes, all these things that a new, newly introduced angelfish can and will munch on as it progresses towards normalcy in its new home in the reef aquarium. Something also very interesting about members of the pomacanthidae is that these fish really don't enjoy much of a food market. People don't eat marine angelfish and they certainly aren't really commercially uh, fished at large. This means that without habitat destruction being absolute, these fish are relatively in consistent supply when it comes to wild caught specimens. Now, this provides an interesting source of debate when you also compare to the fact that there have been several breakthroughs in aquaculturing these fish, like tangs and other marine fish, several members of the pomacanthidae have been aquacultured for the very first time in this century, meaning that for the first time, the average reef aquarist consumer has a choice between a wild caught specimen and a fully aquacultured one. This introduces an interesting paradigm where 
unlike other marine fish species that will be cultured no matter what because of their food value outside of the industry, think like groupers and even some tangs and the like, angelfish are more one of those fish families that the industry itself is pushing the, the not only knowledge of how to culture them, but the desire and the economic initiative to have these fish produced, purchased, and spend their lives in a captive environment. Now that we've seen plenty of specimens of the pomacanthidae inside the retail environment where they're more or less in holding waiting to be brought to a new home, I thought it'd be really interesting to bring you to the TSA farm and we're gonna go over two of my favorite specimens that I saw when I was a, a bright-eyed new recruit starting my first day there. We have uh, in the Belafonte aqua, uh, coral aquaculture system, we have a wonderful queen angelfish. In our Sherwood coral production system, in the refugium, we have a wonderful emperor angelfish. Both an emperor of the Indo-Pacific and a queen of the Caribbean. Let's go see them and discuss a little bit homocanthids inside a little bit more of a context with actual corals in an artificial reef. Let's go to the TSA farm. Hi, I'm, I'm back at the TSA farm. And look who's made an appearance. Why, it's our very own queen angelfish that for some reason we've decided to keep in one of our coral production systems. And look at that. We can see here that uh, some very voracious feeding behavior happening right off the bat. Now, according to this study I've been looking at from wild queen angelfish found off the coast of San Paulo, Brazil, their diet was, let's see here, 68% sponges, 25% uh, algae, mostly Calerpa racemosa, 5% bryozoans. Now here, uh, their diet is about 20% dry nori, 20% uh, uh, wonderful frozen thawed pea mysis, maybe 5% coral food, and 100% of our patients here at the farm because this fish eats zoas, eats soft corals, and uh, if left unkept and if our coral farmers weren't very attentive, it could eat many, many hundred dollars worth of livestock if uh, given the opportunity. We can see here um, one of the wonderful uh, opportunities and also uh, you know, tight ropes that we walk here at the TSA farm, where we get to enjoy working with some of these coral feeding species, just as long as we know what we're dealing with as far as the species of fish, the species of angelfish, what it's naturally inclined to do, and then we know more importantly, our angelfish in its context, in this tank, and after watching, feeding it, cleaning after it, and tolerating its shenanigans day in and day out, having it clean up when we scrape the glass and the like, we now know what we can and cannot get away with when it comes to this particular specimen. And this is the kind of intimate relationship and understanding one must build when having and trying to engage with a long-term occupancy and you know, when you're having angelfish long-term. So you'll see here that this is a mostly SPS dominated system in Belafonte. We do not have a bunch of zoanthids. We do not have a bunch of LPS everywhere here as it can and will present a threat to uh, you know, give an opportunity for our nice queenie here to have a bite. So wanted to provide a little bit of a context here when it comes to an actual angelfish that we enjoy here at the TSA farm. Here in our Sherwood system in the sump here, we can see another wonderful pomacanthid we have at the TSA farm. This is our emperor angelfish, native to the Indo-Pacific. We can see here another curious interaction where one, we don't trust this fish near any coral whatsoever, and two, kind of a curious uh, observation when it comes to the quote unquote aggression of this fish. We can see where it's mostly in with big cohabitants when it comes to the big flamingos and the like that share its uh, tank, but it can also be tolerant a very, very small fish, such as the mollies that are swimming around it. We can see here when it comes to aggression with the pomacanthids, uh, aggression can be very specific and it can also be absolute. I wouldn't necessarily add another male emperor angelfish in here of any size, as it may very well become the subject of uh, territoriality from our male here. On a subtle side note, what I find most fascinating about this fish family is not how necessarily beautiful or jaw-dropping they are, though don't get me wrong, I really enjoy some of their colors. It's not even in their particular behavior where they, they almost have a very individualistic personality, a very social fish to own in a way. Now that's fascinating, but not my favorite either. I have to say, it's the diet. It's the diet and understanding the comparison between the, the thriving queen angelfish that we have here in our Belafonte system, and, and comparing that to a wild pomacanthid on the wild reef, eating all those bryozoans, tunicates, polychaetes, 
developing its own particular taste for the right angle on that one sponge that it's developed a taste for. So I'd like to end this episode with a couple quick questions. What is your favorite marine angelfish species? What's a diet that you presented yours and have you had success with it? Uh, does it matter to you if, if we have wild caught angelfish versus aquacultured ones, if they do the same in the aquarium? Uh, comment below, please subscribe, and feed that algorithm like our hungry queen angelfish waiting for that one day that a new guy drops a zoanthid into the frag tank of Belafonte. Thank you and we will see you next time.